great. Good morning, church. Um, my name's Derek. I'm one of the pastors here at Lake Springs, so uh, thank you for taking time to be here today. Um, when I lived in Georgia, I would oftentimes work a student camp every summer, uh, and by work, I mean I would either usually be the preacher or the worship leader for two consecutive weeks of camp. Uh, middle school and high school week. So I'd be there for middle school. I'd go home for like a day or two, hang out with the family, and then I'd turn around and come right back for high school camp. And it was great. I loved it. But at the camp, there was this family who lived there all year round. They were the caretakers. They're very humble people. They didn't have much saved up in the bank. They, they had been pastors in like the first half of their life. They didn't have a retirement plan, benefits, or anything like that in the conventional sense. And one day, while I was at the camp, I noticed one of the caretakers was out back behind the kitchen as I was walking through, and he was up to his ears in this very dark substance that smelled disgusting. And I said everything okay and he said with a smile on his face yep just time to clean out the grease traps now this man and his wife they did not own the camp someone else did they were just the caretakers the camp was built and created to welcome children and students and churches to foster deeper connections with God and with each other. And it was out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, literally the middle of nowhere. Like, if you thought that you were going to get cell service, you had to drive like 10 minutes just to get cell service. Like, out in the middle of nowhere. And at one point, it had a very strong and vibrant ministry where people were coming in all the time. And yet, that had become less and less the case over the years. But that did not change how these caretakers took care of this property because they knew there were going to be a few weeks a year where the cabins would be full and where the lunch hall would be packed. They knew that there were a few weeks a year where the sound of praise would reverberate the walls of the small little concrete worship center. They knew there were a few weeks a year where a few brave young men and young women would walk into the pool hoping to give their life to Jesus and come out saved and set free from sin, baptized. And that was always enough motivation for them to take care of what had been entrusted to them with everything they had to give. They would clean a million grease traps a million days in a row because they knew without them, This place wouldn't exist, and these life-changing opportunities and encounters wouldn't take place. They did what they did with very little attached to their name because they understood where true riches really come from. They understood that the camp wasn't theirs, but it was God's. And so I want to just talk about this idea with you by looking at a passage in Luke chapter 12. So if you have your Bible, go to Luke chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one. And the seat back's in front of you, and you can turn to page 846, and you will find Luke chapter 12 there. Um, We're starting a new series today on the spiritual practice of generosity. And you may know very well by now, especially if you've been in the church at any point in time, that about 25% of Jesus' teachings center around the idea of money and generosity. But what most people don't realize is that nearly 50% of his parables actually revolve around the idea or reference stewardship. Stewardship can be defined this way, the active and responsible management of God's creation for God's purposes. Today, we are going to look at this parable, which is part of one of Jesus' largest teachings on money, and we are going to come back to this chapter again through the series, but we're going to look at this parable that talks about this idea of stewardship. So look at verse 35, all right? It says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. 
Now, in this parable, Jesus is, is encouraging his followers to be like servants who are, who are just waiting and taking care of this wealthy aristocrat's uh, house. And so he's out gallivanting around, and, and, they, and he's, he's saying our, our servants should be waiting for him to return, just sitting there waiting for him to come home. But there's a twist about this landowner and this homeowner and this aristocrat. Look at verse 36. It says, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve and will have them recline at the table and will come and wait on them. So the master in this story is very different than what you might expect. He's not looking for the servants to come and serve him when he returns home, but instead he changes his clothes, gets into servant clothes, and then tells his servants to recline at the table so that he might serve them. This is a picture of the upside-down kingdom that, that Jesus is, is coming on the scene and portraying to all the people that he's speaking with and teaching and talking to. And this is the description of how Jesus views God. He continues in verse 42. Jump down there with me. It says, Then the Lord answered, Who, who then is a faithful and wise manager? whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will be put in charge of all his possessions. So in this, we see that uh, if the servant is doing a good job and taking care of what's been entrusted to him, that the master is going to give him even more to steward and be entrusted with. And in verse 45, it continues. It says this about those who aren't as faithful. It says, But suppose a servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. This is a picture of what it looks like to waste the resources of the manager and honestly treat others with contempt. He says in verse 46, the master of that servant will come on the day that he does not expect him at an hour in which he is not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with unbelievers. And Jesus sums up this teaching in verse 48 when he says, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been, been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So this teaching, it centers around and shows us that stewardship is about taking care of what's been entrusted to us. And if we do that well, God or the master will entrust us with more to take care of. But there are three kind of key things we have to understand about stewardship if we're going to get it right. So let's talk about those three things. The first one is that God owns it all. God owns it all. You see, this is a primary idea or theological concept throughout the entirety of Scripture. Genesis 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. And then he makes this beautiful garden and then he breathes life into humanity. Uh, uh, and so you see from the very outset that God, he owns it all, but he's also very generous. He's giving to humanity what they need. And then in chapter 2, you see that he says, now I want you to take care of this. So it's, this is stewardship language, that God owns it, but he's giving it to the humanity to partner with him to take care of it, that we might steward it well. You continue to see this theme all throughout Scripture. Leviticus 25, verse 23 says, The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 14, it says, To the Lord your God belongs the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. In Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12, you see every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills, the world is mine and all that is in it. And so the point throughout the library of scripture from Genesis all the way to maps is that God owns it all. 
And you may buy and sell and build and so forth and so on, but you are just caretakers of what has been entrusted and will always ultimately be God's. So secondly, we must realize that God doesn't just entrust us with these things, but he entrusts us with these things and his resources in order to do good. He wants us to do good with what he's given us. See, in a lot of churches, one of the things that I think is really interesting is that you hear about this aspect of giving 10% or giving a tithe. That's what uh, the word tithe means. It just means 10%. And then if you give 10%, then you're a good steward. This is what I was taught growing up. I watched my mom write a check to the church every single Sunday morning, and she put it in the offering plate as it went by. It was our 10%. It was our tithe. And, and that's, a, that's a fine teaching and a good teaching and one that we should probably try and practice. But, but the, the interesting thing about that was I never, uh, I never left going, oh, man, I've been a good steward because I gave my 10%, Right? Um, I, I, I walked away with this, this feeling or this idea, well, if I do give my 10%, if I give my 10%, well, then the other 90 is for me to do whatever I want with, right? Like, I mean, as long as I give my 10, I'm good. But that's not the idea of the Bible or the idea of stewardship. See, biblical stewardship is realizing that 100% has been entrusted to us, and we are to use 100% to the glory of God. Now, what this typically means is that this 100% gets woven into three different categories. There's a category to live, and a category to build, and a category to give. See, some of this money is given to us from God as a gift to us in order that we might live and enjoy life. James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of the heavenly lights. He sends down generous blessing to us. He is a generous God who loves you and blesses you, and he gives to you so that you can have a beautiful and abundant life. Life, But then there's also a portion of this that we're called to give back, and we're called to give to the poor or, or to uh, those that, that come to us and potentially might have a special need or a special request. We're called to give to the church, to missionaries, to missions organizations, people and things that are sharing the gospel around the world. And then there's also a portion that we have that we can use to build, to build for the future, but also to build to help grow God's kingdom. And this makes up 100% of what it is that we've been given, and we are not called to just use 10% of it for good, but we're called to use 100% of it for good. So the third and final way that we have to think about stewardship and begin to understand it is that God blesses us not so that we can have more, but so that we can give more. He doesn't bless us that we can have more, but he blesses so that we can give more. He blesses us to be a blessing. I love how Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, which is one of the most beautiful teachings that you'll ever find on generosity. In it, Paul is trying to raise money for the church of Macedonia, uh, for the church in Jerusalem that's going through a severe famine. And this is what he writes. He says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, this is one of those passages in the Bible that I like to say gets hijacked. Because there are a lot of people who will take this passage of Scripture and begin to tell you or begin to preach you what people in the American church or in Western culture would call the prosperity gospel, which honestly is a heretical and cancerous teaching that is no gospel at all. 
And so if you're listening to people like Joyce Meyer or Benny Hinn or Joel Olstein, please stop because they are perpetuating a false teaching. But here's what I want you to understand. The reason why it's a false gospel is because it says give to get. That if you give to God, he will give you more back. And, and this means that your motivation for giving is greed, which is a really, really destructive and sinful force in most people's lives. We'll talk about in length next week. But that is also why it's really, really popular, is because it plays to your greed, that you might give in order to get. Don't, don't be fooled. That is not what this is teaching. There are two words that Paul uses here that flip that heresy on its head, and it is the words, so that. You will be enriched in every way, so that you might be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You see, the prosperity gospel really isn't just a blatant lie. It's more of like a half-truth. Because if you are generous, God will give you more. But not so that you can hoard it and build bigger barns and have the best life now, but so that you can be generous. On every occasion. Randy Alcorn says it this way. He says, God blesses us to increase our standard of giving, not our standard of living. So, biblical stewardship can best be summed up by the fact that God owns it all. That he entrusts us with his resources for us to do good. And he blesses us not so that we can have more, but so that we can give more. And so if this is true, there's some critical questions that we have to begin to ask. We can't, we can't just ask, well, how much should I give away? We should, we should ask, how much should I actually keep for myself? A lot of times we're taught uh, to think about money and our relationship with money in a couple of different ways, as like a saver or a spender. Let's see the hands raised for those who are savers. Go ahead. Let's see them up. Come on. You know who you are? You know who you are? All right. Now, if you're a spender, go ahead and raise your hand. All right. Let me see that. All right. Okay. You know who you are, right? That I, I get it, right? I totally understand. You're like Savers, they tend to be motivated by safety and security, and, and they're kind of afraid to lose it. Uh, spenders, they tend to be motivated by greed and incessant desire for more. And I got to be honest with you, man. I got fear and greed in my heart. I got to be real honest with you. So uh, my guess is maybe you can understand that too. You might have a little bit of that too. But I think there's one way that Jesus talks about and teaches us to live as his followers, and that is one of stewardship. And this idea of stewardship, it is a spiritual practice. It is a spiritual discipline. And with all spiritual disciplines, there are always some biblical best practices that we can help you, or we can use to help cultivate and walk in this way of Jesus. And so uh, I just want to give you some best practices when it comes to generosity that come straight from Scripture uh, so that you might steward what God has given you well uh, and, and be able to create a plan that shows that you are being intentional with the, with the resources that God has blessed you with. And so the first best practice is it should be regular. It should be regular. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says, on the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money. So he's saying like, hey, every week, or at least in a regular occurrence, you should be setting aside some money to be able to give away. And how do we determine how much? Well, he says that at the second part of that verse, where he says it should be proportional. It should be proportional. He says, set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. So all you rich people out there who make a lot of money, right, you give more. All you poor people, you give less. But you give proportionally based on your income, right? You don't, you don't 
like give um, just on a whim. But you think about, well, how much have I actually been blessed with? And you give proportionally according to that. Then, thirdly, in 2 Corinthians 8, he's talking about giving again or generosity again. And he says it should be sacrificial. Should be sacrificial. He says in, in, in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 3, he says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. One of the most understated things when it comes to being generous or being generous people is that the Bible paints a picture that Christians don't just give a little bit, but they give beyond their ability. They give because they truly have faith that God is in control and that God takes care of them. They believe that in their heart of hearts. For some of you, 10% is an act of faith. For some of you, 10% is easy. It's just another bill you pay every month. And you don't feel it at all. And some of you, 1% would really hurt. <laughs> and for some of you, it wouldn't hurt until you started giving 50. I don't know where you are in that and i'm not saying there's a right or wrong but i do think man like if if we can if we can just go through life and and it not and, and like our our trying to follow jesus and our generosity not actually cost us anything then we might be doing it wrong and number four best practice is that it should be motivated by the gospel should be motivated by the gospel. 2 Corinthians 8 also says this. says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake, poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. See, the gospel is this picture of a God who owns it all, giving it all up for people who don't deserve it and have done nothing to earn what he offers to us. He becomes a poor, lowly human. He takes on the nature of a servant and he dies on a cross in order to give us the generous gift of love and grace and eternal life. We mimic the generosity of God and the gospel when we are generous and give ourselves and the things he's entrusted to us for his glory. The fifth best practice that we find in scripture is that it should be voluntary. 2 Corinthians 9, again, a part of that teaching that... Uh, that, that Paul talks about or that we talked about earlier. He says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. So this should be a matter of the heart, something that you wrestle with, and it should be voluntary. You should choose of your own accord to give. You should want to do it, desire to do it as, a, as an act of, of service and love. And the sixth best practice is it should be joyful. He says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, but God, for God loves a cheerful giver. When you give, it should make you smile. You should be full of joy to, to be able to offer something to the poor or to someone who's in need. Or to the church or to missions around the world that, that share the gospel. You should, you should feel joyous because God has blessed you so greatly that you can be such a great blessing to others. So, I think it's pretty clear the picture that the Bible paints for us, right? That we don't own it, we're just caretakers. We're just caretakers of His resources. And whatever we do with those, whether that's, that's money or time or gifts or creation, whatever it is, we're called to use it for 
good. To be generous with those things for the good of God and for his kingdom. And my hope is that maybe some of these best practices when it comes to generous giving with, with your finances uh, that are found in, in the, the two letters to the Corinthians might also help you start somewhere. Which is really like the next step, right? Is to start somewhere. You see, like everything else, a spiritual journey, you're never going to arrive, right? But we all have a starting point, and we all have to start somewhere. And you may not feel like, man, I, have a, I, don't, I don't have anything extra to give. Well, trust God. <laughs> give beyond what you think you're able, and start somewhere. And that might be $10, that might be a dollar, it might be very, very little, but don't have a scarcity mindset when you serve the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns it all. He has it all. And he can bless you and enrich you in every way so that you can be generous every chance you get. On every occasion. So start somewhere. Maybe you're already being very generous. Or maybe you're already trying to practice generosity. Then I would say, what's your next step? Can you take a next step in your journey? Can you go further? Maybe for some of you, you already give to the church. Or you give to a missions organization or something like that. But, like you're, uh, but, but maybe something for you would be to sit down with your spouse or or something like that, and, and say, you know what, let's, let's start a generosity fund. Let's just set aside $20 a month, and whenever a need comes up, or we hear of a need, or we see someone on the road that is, is in need, like we have an opportunity to meet that need with whatever it is. Start something new. Start somewhere. But I also want to say this. In case some of you came in here today, and maybe... You just heard me say this, or maybe you felt like you heard me say this. You felt like I was telling you, you need to give. That's true. <laughs> you got me. Uh, but I also want you to know that if you're struggling to know where to get started, that's okay. And if you're struggling because, like, you just, you know your finances, and you know it's tight. And you know it's difficult. I get it. I want you to know that we have something specifically for you to try and help you start somewhere, help you take a next step and figure out the best way for you to be generous so that you never have questions about what you can and cannot do. But you can just be generous on every occasion and watch God truly bless your life and use you to bless other people. Two of our elders, Gary Adams and Philip Bond, they're going to be leading a Financial Peace University class here at the church on Wednesday nights. And, um, and it's going to last pretty much through the, through the semester. And the cost of this class is $80, okay? The cost of this class is $80. Now, $80, if you have a spouse, that include, that, that, that's cost of admission for you and your spouse, if you're single, then it would be cost just for you, um, but, but it, is, it is $80. And I would encourage you that if you struggle putting it together and living on a budget, if you struggle seeing how you might be generous, I would encourage you to sign up for this class. I've taken this class, and it has absolutely trans, like, transformed the way Mallory and I look at money and how we handle money and how we use our money. And... Um, and here's the other thing. Some of you are like, man, $80 is a lot. I know. $80 is a lot. It's, it's a lot for me, right? I think about what I, I, I can take my wife on a date and have babysitting that same night if I, if, I have, if I have $80. So $80 is not like an insignificant amount of money. And so I'll just say this. Mallory and I, we talked about it. And we personally are willing to pay for half of four people or four couples to go through this class, okay? So that would cut your cost in half down to $40. We do want you to have some skin in the game because if you don't have any skin in the game, then you might just come to the first one and then not come back. So we want you to have some sort of investment to say this is something I need, this is something I want, but $8 might be too much, and if it is, then just come talk to me. 
and I'll give you $40 to the first four people who ask me, okay? I'll give you $40 to help pay for your class so that you can do it um, because I believe in it. And I believe that, man, like if you're in that spot, you need it. And I want to help however I can. We believe and we refuse to put heavy burdens on people, things that feel heavy and feel hard and feel difficult without lifting a finger to help. That's what the Pharisees do. And we aren't going to do that. So we're here to help. But you have to swallow your pride. You have to come and ask for it. And we'll be happy, happy to help. You get out of bondage financially. All you have to do is come and ask for help. And you can begin to start this journey toward financial freedom. That's our hope. And that's our prayer. And our hope and our prayer is whenever you can begin to move in that direction, that you might see the, the power the power of good stewardship and an amazing, amazing sacrificial generosity and that God will keep blessing you so that you can keep being a blessing again and again and again on every occasion. All right? Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, today. Thank you for just the chance that we have to, to get into this place and to sing and to worship to thank you for who you are, to thank you for the ways in which you are, are working and are transforming our lives. God, I know that some, some of us in this room, we, we need to take a next step in our discipleship, to be generous, to give back, But it's a whole lot easier to do that when we realize you own it all. That we honestly can't outgive you. That you've given and given and given and continue to give grace upon grace upon grace. And so, God, I just pray that our hearts might be moved by that. By looking at our God and our master who is a generous and wealthy servant but for our sake became poor. That we might become rich. That we might inherit the riches of his grace. God, so thank you for blessing us and giving us new life. Thank you for giving us hope and peace through your broken body and through your shed blood. May we never lose sight of how good and how generous you are. Help us. Help us to trust you more. Help us to take advantage of each opportunity presented to us to be generous and to do good with the resources that you've entrusted to us. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.